As with most crafts, the carpenters of colonial North America worked under their familiar European system of guilds. Apprentices became journeymen who became masters, the developers of their day. But all carpenters organized to set rates for the work they did. Framing floors of joists of nine inches deep per square, eight shillings. Girders of seven inches deep per foot running, eight pence. The Carpenter's Company rule book 1786. Activists from the start, American carpenters played key roles in the revolution. They made up the core of the Boston Tea Party. In the Philadelphia Carpenters Hall, the delegates to the First Continental Congress met in 1774 to air their grievances against King George III. By the end of the 1700s, North American economic growth brought larger construction projects, more costly than most master carpenters could finance. Speculators began to displace them as developers and owners on new projects. Masters became contractors and journeymen became wage workers. Because it was their labor creating the profits, journeymen were pushed to work harder for longer hours at the same day's wage. After years under this system, our forebears began to seek changes. By the 1830s, we were organizing unions in North America's many unconnected markets. In York, Ontario, carpenters organized to get paid on time. Elsewhere, carpenters agitated for shorter hours at the same day's pay. We have been too long subjected to the odious, cruel, unjust, a tyrannical system which compels the optimal mechanic to exhaust his physical and mental powers by excessive toil. Boston Carpenters, 1835. Union journeymen in Philadelphia organized Carpenter to Carpenter with their non-union brothers. They sparked a citywide general strike that won the 10-hour day. Other cities followed suit. But cities soon were eclipsed as the fast-spreading railroads created nationwide labor markets in the U.S. and Canada. And those newly mobile wage workers found themselves in competition with slave labor. Abolitionist Frederick Douglass, in fact, had worked as a slave carpenter in the Baltimore shipyards. The slave is robbed by his master. And the white man is robbed by the slave system because he is flung into competition with a class of laborers who work without wages. Frederick Douglass, 1858. For carpenters, the battle to end slavery was an economic as well as a moral issue. After the Civil War, an industrial revolution began that transformed construction across the U.S. and Canada. It threatened to fragment the craft and drive down wages. Machines took the making of doors and windows out of the carpenter's workshop and into planing mills. Speculators sliced job site carpentry into repetitive tasks. Apprenticeship disintegrated. Time and again, organized carpenters saw hordes of itinerant carpenters arrive by train. A national, even international union was needed. Peter J. McGuire, who had organized his brother carpenters in St. Louis, was called on to form such a union. The Brotherhood was founded in August 1881 in Chicago under a constitution that still governs the UBC today. McGuire's founding credo, educate, agitate, organize. Every city should be organized and the wages of all advance to a uniform standard. Men will not then rush readily from one city to another to fill the places of their brothers on a strike. Best of all, strikes will be less in number, for employers will then fear to oppose us. P.J. McGuire, The Carpenter, May 1881. From the start, this was a union united for mutual support as carpenters. Then, as now, a major portion of working carpenters were immigrants. McGuire ran articles in The Carpenter in German and other languages. He learned to speak German himself. In the South, white and black locals affiliated with the UBC. 
Because builders recruited strike breakers to move both ways across the U.S.-Canada border, American and Canadian locals were chartered. The founders of the Brotherhood opened the union to everybody who did carpenter work, or what had ever been carpenter work. From highly skilled millwrights to workers in the planing and sawmills. Competition among ourselves reduces wages and renders one workman the victim of another. But with organization, all this is changed. Hence, we must form a union broad enough to embrace every carpenter and joiner in the land. Preamble to the UBC Constitution, 1881. McGuire also sparked the first Labor Day in New York City in 1882. Workers didn't ask permission, they just took the day off, showing their strength. City by city in the years following, they did the same, until the U.S. Congress and Canadian Parliament made the holiday official. Strikes for the eight-hour day in 1886 and 1890 brought tens of thousands of carpenters into the Brotherhood. To keep up with technological changes in the industry, local unions reinvigorated apprenticeship and acquired new skills. The Young Brotherhood quickly gained strength and played a major role in organizing other labor groups. In 1886, McGuire and UBC leaders helped form the American Federation of Labor, predecessor of the AFL-CIO. And in Hamilton, Ontario, carpenter John Flett was an early president of the group that became today's Canadian Labor Congress. In those first two decades, the UBC grew by organizing aggressively. Journeymen organized carpenter to carpenter, then visited the contractors and told them what wages and conditions they would work under. Des Moines, Iowa. The spirit of unionism among carpenters is spreading rapidly here. Each member has appointed himself a committee of one. Over 60 names have been added to our roles. Charleston, South Carolina. The nine-hour day has been established. The apprentice system is being enforced and the bosses now pay off during working hours. We have no trouble with the contractors, except one, and he fell in line within six hours. Auburn, New York. At a recent meeting, the following proposition was adopted, that on or after April 1st, eight hours shall constitute a day's work. The craft is well organized here. Success brought full-time general officers and a headquarters in Indianapolis. To police agreements, locals began hiring business agents. In markets the Brotherhood dominated, these business agents could organize directly with new contractors, organizing from the top down. But where that approach wasn't backed by carpenters recruiting one-on-one, -on -one, organizing from the bottom up, the seeds of future problems were sown. In the early 20th century, major regional and national builders began to emerge. They attacked the carpenters in cities where the UBC was dominant, Chicago, New York, Toronto, and San Francisco. Despite the attacks, the UBC won union standards on government work during World War I. Tens of thousands of new workers were added to the union's roles, long on numbers, but often short on personal commitment to the union. During the 1920s, the Brotherhood fought tough battles against continental big business organizations. City by city across North America, builders pushed the anti-union notion of the open shop. In the U.S., they called it the American plan. In Canada, they dropped the name but kept the strategy. You can hardly conceive of a more un-American, a more anti-American institution than that the union shop. It is really very remarkable that it is allowed to exist under the American flag. National Association of Manufacturers, 1920. But even during the 1920s construction boom, the Brotherhood launched no new organizing drives. The general office began referring to organizers as international representatives. Membership stagnated. Some markets were lost entirely. The UBC had been wholly transformed. What began as an organizing union, members working together to add strength and market share, had become a servicing union, 
working mainly to protect existing jobs instead of organizing new jobs and new members. Membership became merely a business deal. And we lost the true meaning of brotherhood, the one-for-all, all-for-one activism. When we became members, we looked over the available information, sized up our chances, became satisfied of the solvency of the organization, talked it over with the wife, perhaps, and decided in our minds that here was a good investment. The Carpenter, August 1928. The Depression hit construction hard. By 1933, 70% of union carpenters were jobless. Some carpenters and millwrights did find work on the large public works projects of Roosevelt's New Deal, including the Hoover and Grand Coulee Dams and the Tennessee Valley Authority. Elsewhere, lumber and mill workers in the Pacific Northwest valiantly struggled to organize, and many became part of the Brotherhood. But for construction jobs, our proud union remained a top-down servicing organization that could do little besides circle the wagons. Then came World War II, which saw many unsung UBC heroes. When Pearl Harbor was bombed, our shipyard workers ran to help while the fires were still raging. Members built the factories and the war material. At the front of the front, they engineered our way across Europe. Other members formed the backbone of the Seabees, the Navy construction battalions building bases under fire across the Pacific. The war years saw membership double with the huge influx of workers into government war work. A construction boom followed the war and kept membership numbers high as returning GI members were welcomed back. In the post-war boom, membership in the Brotherhood reached new heights, more than 833,000 in 1973. And the UBC enjoyed a market share as high as 90% in many areas. The Brotherhood achieved solid benefits like health insurance, vacation pay, and pensions. Apprenticeship was also...